All right, hello and welcome to the third uh, serious security seminar. Um, so today we're excited to have Doug Smith. Uh, so Doug Smith is a technical fellow and manager of engineering at Northrop Grumman. Um, he's been a software engineer for uh, 25 years and uh, spent 10 years uh, uh, serving as a US Marine beforehand. Sure. Um, so we're excited to have him talk to us uh, today about uh, secure code development. Uh, um, so how to develop code uh, without uh, introducing uh, all the vulnerabilities. Um, so take it away, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, so for those of you here in the room at least, uh, give me an idea of your experience with this subject between being brand new to it, being familiar with it, and being the researcher I need to avoid getting taking questions from. Uh, so how many are completely new to the topic of secure coding? Got uh, about half the hands, so some familiarity. Anybody doing their PhD on it? Okay, good, thank goodness. <laughs> um, all right, and bef before I start, I need to uh, begin with a message from your sponsor and, and explain how I got to be here today. Um, I'm involved with a program at Northrop Grumman that's designed to bring uh, advanced degrees into the company, masters and PhD students, uh, that serve three one-year rotations under me, and then we send them off to enjoy the rest of the company. Uh, so we have seven Purdue grads right now in doing their uh, rotational program, and I have one of my new employees who started this, uh, uh, this summer, Dr. Jeff Avery, who came through Sirius. Uh, so it's a, a great opportunity, the best way to become an employee at Northrop Grumman if you meet the criteria and if you do, uh, come see me. It's, um, application goes on now for positions to start sometime in 2018. All right, so secure coding. Um, this module is part of the uh, software coaching program that we have at Northrop Grumman. It's a two-year program. We cover the IEEE software engineering body of knowledge in the first year, and then the second year advanced topics. And, and secure coding is one of our advanced topics. And the whole point of this is to, uh, to reach out to practitioners, so not just developers. Uh, we'll talk more about what we consider practitioners, uh, about how and why to do secured code development. Topics here, uh, just a very couple of definitions what I mean by secure coding and uh, why we use the term software assurance uh, uh, as an umbrella term for that. Um, talk a little bit about the threat. Uh, that will be familiar to many of you, I expect. Uh, some of the guidance and regulations that we have to develop under uh, as a government contractor. Uh, and then the activities that we actually do in our projects at Northrop Grumman to help us achieve secure code. And then uh, a couple of fun examples um, using vulnerabilities that you guys are all probably well aware of. Uh, I should mention my, uh, uh, the, the authors of this original uh, package, uh, one of my fellow tech fellows, Ray Renner, um, and another FTL, one of those, uh, a graduate from that program I was talking about, Arthur Bachelor. So software assurance, what is it? Um, two things we're really worried about in software assurance. Number one is that the software does what we want it to do, and number two is that it doesn't do things we don't want it to do. Uh, and in that latter category, we're worried both about things that were accidentally put there, which has been the biggest source of vulnerabilities in the past, as well as things that were intentionally put there, not only by developers on our project, but other sources. Um, one of the major vulnerability uh, attack avenues that we'll, uh, we'll talk about. And then we, we use software assurance instead of just software or secure coding because uh, it's a large field. There's a whole bunch of things we worry about, particularly software safety. We do uh, systems that fly in space. We do systems that medically people's lives depend on. Uh, so software safety is a big uh, component of it that we won't be talking about today. Um, and then in addition to secure coding, the, the security aspects include the other things you see here on the slide. Uh, so automated software quality, we're big on both dynamic and static code scanning. Uh, so we scan the source with static analyzers, and then once we're to the point where we can build it, we'll run dynamically and watch what's going over the wire. Um, we're big into DevOps. Is DevOps a familiar term on campus? Um, kind of the, the bleeding of agile from development into the operations and maintenance phase of the life cycle to where dev and ops used to have a wall between them and we would finish our software and we would throw it over the wall for them to operate. Um, and really the, the advent of AWS, uh, uh, Amazon Web Services, and the massive scaling of sites uh, like eBay and uh, Flickr and uh, Google, 
the Amazon shopping experience. Uh, all of those have adopted this uh, set of techniques known as DevOps. Um, and automated testing is a huge component of that. Um, I talked about the vulnerability scanning and then just overall quality assurance. There, uh, we have an entire discipline of folks that we tend to recall uh, uh, mission assurance engineers whose job is to help make sure that we're meeting the first two things in that definition, that the software does what we want it to and doesn't do what we don't want it to. So within software assurance, when we talk about secure coding itself, um, what do we mean? Well, the first thing to note, it is multidisciplinary. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, we're, it's the things we want our software practitioners to do. Um, one, so that they don't introduce vulnerabilities, right? It's really easy to, to do those if you're not uh, uh, doing the kind of preventive measures that, that avoid them. Um, and then to make sure our software performs well when it's under attack, because we know that the systems we build uh, are under attack as soon as they go live. Um, so we want them to resist uh, most of the attacks we know about. Uh, for things like zero days, we want them to tolerate and mitigate the impacts of those. And then if somebody does get through and crashes our system, we want it to recover gracefully and quickly. Yes? Um, well, so fortunately for us, uh, we're tightly defined by a set of contracts for almost every project we do. Um, and so wholly apart from producing a software product that pleases a customer, we've got a band of uh, uh, contract officers watching on both sides to ensure that our scope doesn't get outside of what was contracted and paid for. <laughs> so. Are you saying that basically you haven't seen any changes sometimes in the middle of that contract? Oh, <laughs> we always see changes in the middle of the contract. That's one of the big reasons uh, I'll, I'll show you our playbook and, okay. and one of the key items in that is to be agile uh, because we, we, we have no customers, even our very best customers cannot write a spec at the beginning of a contract that's what they truly want delivered at the end of the contract. All right, so I'll talk um, about the, uh, the objectives in a minute. If um, in, the, in the, the security field, you'll often see uh, CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These four are a restatement of that, and uh, you'll see that when it comes back later. Now, I mentioned multidisciplinary, and I, and I also said software practitioner as opposed to software developer, uh, because we find that building secure systems is in fact a team sport, and it's not something that just the developer can do. Um, so we need participation from our customers. Um, they, they tell us what to do, right? So we're, we're not doing a commercial product like you know, Microsoft Word where we can decide what features to throw in there. And when we push for security, sometimes they push back and say, nope, that's not within my budget. That's as much as I'd want it. I can't afford to pay for it. Um, so that the customer is a key piece. And then the whole staff that make up our software development team uh, all have roles to play in ensuring the, the, uh, the security of our products. So let's talk about those four objectives. Um, so dependability, again, is when I'm running the program, it does what I expect it to do, and it doesn't do what I don't expect it to do, right? There's no side effects in there. That's dependability. Uh, trustworthiness is the things beyond what I'm trying to get it to do. Um, so are there latent vulnerabilities in there? Are, are there back doors? That kind of thing. We talked about our, our goal to, uh, uh, to uh, resist, tolerate, and recover. Uh, that comes into the revealance, uh, resilience and uh, survivability, where um, we know that uh, the, the systems we build are long live. I mean, our, our average product life cycle is not the year and a half you get with a commercial product. Most of ours live 30, 40 years, um, uh, 10 usually at the very least. And my particular group within Northrop Grumman supports federal agencies, and we support eight of the 10 oldest running systems in the, uh, in the federal government. So we have uh, ALC, Jovial, uh, COBOL, you know, things that uh, fell out of use before most of you guys were born. So uh, um, with the resilience and survivability, one of the key things we're worried about is when current assumptions no longer hold. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about defense in depth. 
a lot of times we built systems with the assumption that it's going to be in the inner sanctum where it's protected by a three-tier layer of security. Um, and then we move to the web and those things are out on the front line and no longer behind that uh, garden wall. One thing that as an industry we do poorly is capture uh, and pass along all of those implicit assumptions uh, that were used for the design of that system. And then conformance, uh, not something you would necessarily think of as a secure coding issue, uh, but for us it is. Uh, I'll talk about two of the major families of uh, computer security standards that we have to follow for application development, one on the DOD side and then on the civil side for uh, out of NIST. Um, but the uh, making sure our programs do what was contracted is a big part of that uh, our overall uh, quality assured software. All right, so let's talk about the threat. This is the fun stuff. Um, the Defense Science Board did an interesting taxonomy where they grouped threats by the level of sophistication of the attacker. All right, so at level one up there, you've got uh, your script kiddies who don't really know anything about uh, uh, cybersecurity. They're just downloading something that they run, and uh, there are ample opportunities to do real damage with, uh, with tools that are available out there on the dark web today. Um, level two, you get a little bit more uh, secure but, or a little bit more capable, but still probably individual actors. Uh, the red bands, three and four, you start moving into more organized groups. Uh, so criminal elements uh, often, uh, often present there. And there uh, you begin to see people that are uh, using zero days, uh, so exploits that have not been publicly acknowledged and uh, uh, for which their patches have not been issued for. Um, and then get into people who are actually putting in rootkits, uh, so you know, in infecting systems down at the, at the base operating system level. Down in uh, layers five and six there, you've got your nation state actors, um, where these are people who are uh, deliberately putting vulnerabilities into systems. Uh, and in fact, at, at level six, you see the, uh, uh, you know, the, the full spectrum cyber offensive where it not only has a cyber component, but it probably has political and economic. Uh, you know, you can think Russian interference in a recent election uh, as an example of that full scale kind of thing where they're, they're doxing to put out fake news as well as, uh, uh, you know, breaking into systems. So that's one way to look at it, uh, by the capability of the actors. Um, another way is to look at the, uh, the type of attack that's being used. Um, so anybody recognize, so we'll start with the heart. Um, anybody recognize that logo? Heart, uh, heart bleed. Um, so this was a case of a programmer making a mistake. It was a, a, a bug, an error in the OpenSSL library that like, three quarters of the world uses for their, uh, on their web servers. Um, anybody recognize that drone over there? RQ-171 uh, with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. This is not a Northrop Grumman drone, I'm happy to say. Um, uh, in this case, this was a design decision. Uh, they um, chose to use commercial grade GPS guidance for this rather than secure military grade GPS. And, and all the guard had to do was overpower a very weak signal coming from a satellite uh, up in geosynchronous orbit, and they fed false GPS coordinates to this drone, caused it to go into its return to base uh, 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 routine, and that's how they captured uh, that drone. So that was a design decision. The decision was not to put in the processing power they needed to handle the encryption of the, the uh, encrypted comm links. Um, bottom right there, uh, recognize the logo. Surely we have some uh, iPhone developers in here. That's the um, uh, Xcode Ghost, uh, which was uh, the, the iOS, the Apple development environment that they provide. Um, and we noticed in a lot of places in China where network speeds are not great, uh, they were caching local copies. And somebody infected one of the local copies of the development environment. And so People grabbing what they thought was an authorized Apple product, use it to build their system. Every app built with those development environments had uh, Trojans built into it. So that's a case where it wasn't a programmer error, it wasn't a design decision, it was actually an impact through the tools. And then the code snippet there, um, the, little, the little yellow highlight is a, uh, a hard-coded password backdoor. 
Um, you may remember that Juniper Routers uh, had uh, some very bad press a while ago, and it turned out that this was uh, some source that a supplier had provided um, that had been infected. So this was a supply chain vulnerability. We, we do one of the uh, code scanning things we do on, on every piece of software we ship, uh, tools like Palomita or Black Duck or uh, um, Sonatype uh, Nexus Lifecycle, where we look to see what modules and what COTS packages are inside those applications. And so the, the commercial package you buy off the, store today, uh, off the shelf in a store today, typically about half of that code is reused modules from somewhere else. And you can bet that that seller is not going to tell you on the box uh, what packages you're using. It's kind of like the Hardbleed OpenSSL, right? Hardly anybody knew at the start that they had that software in their system at all, right? Because it's not the end item that you went out to procure. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the pipeline through which we get all of our software components, our supply chain, uh, is a matter of grave concern to us. And we want the... Uh, uh, authentication on every step of that. We need to know if it came from a secure source or we have to assume that it's untrusted and do all that security scanning ourselves. All right, so those are uh, for the types of threats, um, different types that we see and have to guard against uh, in our planning for software security. And IEEE Center for uh, uh, Secure Design, in, in going through their uh, vulnerabilities they knew about, they found that they were the, the vast majority were of the, the first two types. Either a programmer made a mistake or there was a design decision. And those were split pretty evenly uh, as the, uh, the, the root cause of the problems that they saw. So um, this is our approach. This is our, uh, our cyber fan. This is our defense in depth approach for all the systems we build. Um, and the, the little center ball here, the mission critical assets, this is our software application. Now, a common problem we have today is that um, a bunch of those applications are web apps. Uh, it's something that the, the government needs a lot of. Uh, it's the way you interface with your government in a lot of cases. Um, and that means I need a direct tunnel through all of this secure stuff into the holy of holies, my, uh, my very, very secure uh, code for my app. So we definitely need the defense in depth. But that application security bar, uh, we need to break out and we need to assume that those other tiers um, are not going to be 100% successful in, uh, in blocking all of, the, uh, all of the attempted exploits. <clears throat> so that's uh, a whirlwind tour through the threat landscape we face. Um, and so what has our government told us to do about it? Right? So two major, uh, ooh, help if I didn't knock the mouse down. Um, two major sources of uh, uh, security guidance we get. The first is from DISA, the Defense Information Security Agency, uh, with their STIGs. Now, anybody encountered STIGs? This is something I would expect you've not had to worry about in an academic environment. Um, it's a list of all of the things you need to do to secure a particular component, whether it's a server, whether it's a, a, a network firewall, whether it's a, a data warehouse, a, an Oracle database, and these get voluminous. I mean, it gets down into every setting on the, uh, on the application that has a security impact. Um, and there are a few of these that address application security. All right, so um, there are process things like you need to run code scanners, um, do those vulnerability scans uh, regularly, um, and then there's individual detail things like uh, avoid this particular routine in this particular language. So lots and lots of, uh, of guidance for developing secure software uh, through the DISA STIGs. And here's the, uh, uh, the CIAs I was talking about, confidentiality, availability, and integrity are the definition they use to assess the criteria, uh, or the severity, rather, um, of a given uh, uh, exploit or vulnerability. And typically, we can't ship with Cat 1s or Cat 2s, right? We've got to fix all of those uh, before we can ship code. So that's on the defense side. Uh, on the federal civil side, we have the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, NIST, um, has this 500-page document um, on security controls. And so down here on the, the application security stuff is here in SA um, under system services acquisition because you're typically acquiring these software products. So let's talk about some of the, some of the ones that are in there. Uh, heavily focuses on testing. Um, 
as the, uh, the major method. Um, we get uh, a little bit of overlap here between cybersecurity aspects uh, and some of the other aspects I talked about, software safety. So uh, MISRA is the uh, uh, motor vehicle uh, information system. So in order to get you know, your Google self-driving car uh, allowed in certain states, there's a set of uh, uh, criteria for that. I talked about man-rated systems. Anything that goes into space with a human on board uh, gets way more testing um, than something that's just going to uh, you know, allow you to, to file your FAFSA to get student aid. Um, so you do get some overlap between the things we have to do for privacy, security, uh, or privacy, safety, and quality with the things we need to do for security. And then the, the particular control I want to talk about in there is uh, SA11, which is the security testing and evaluation. And there, there's a couple of these that I'll highlight, the ones there in bold, uh, talk a little bit more about. So the first one is static code analysis. I talked about this. These are uh, tools you may have heard of, CAST AIP, Coverity. SonarCube is the one we've adopted enterprise-wide. Uh, you're more likely to use it. It's open source. It's free um, uh, and uh, really, really helpful. Uh, the, the only bad thing about these tools is the high false positives. You run it against a, a, a legacy code base, and you get tens of thousands. I mean, it's like you've turned on all the compiler options the first time you compile a, a big suite of software. So um, triaging that deluge uh, is a bit of an issue. But one of the things we're finding is that not only can we automate the scanning of our code, we can automate the remediation of a lot of those issues. Uh, so we don't, we don't just uh, have a, a rogue AI going through changing our code, but uh, the vulnerabilities, the, the kinds of things it finds, so uh, undefined variables, uh, uh, you know, failing to follow coding standards, uh, uh, memory allocation, deallocation, that kind of stuff, uh, a lot of that we can do in an automated fashion and then present it uh, to the developer already fixed just for uh, an approval and sign off. Dynamic code analysis then is the, the bad thing about dynamic code analysis is it needs a running system, right? So we can't check it early like we can with static code analysis. And in fact, when we're running static code analysis on our builds on most projects so that um, you're doing continuous integration, continuous delivery. So, you know, we check in and immediately the, the system is built. Um, we don't even wait then to do the checks. Our developers have plugins in their IDEs typically that are doing uh, these kind of checks. So then uh, once we do get to the point where we're fielding a system, uh, it's, it's running in the operational environment, we'll always run a uh, dynamic code analysis, uh, analyzer. So the two big ones are the HP Web Inspect and uh, uh, oh, what's the other piece? Um, and then IBM's AppScan. Uh, HP names are two. I've got it in here somewhere. Uh, Web Inspect, there it is. So Web Inspect and, uh, and Fortify, I'm sorry, are the two HP components. Uh, and then AppScan does both static and dynamic analysis if you're in an, uh, an IBM uh, rational kind of environment. Uh, so again, we're watching, watching things that go over the, the wire. Um, so that's the main um, web app scanning is the big part of that. Um, you know, we can find things like if passwords are sending clear text kind of thing, it will, uh, it will detect. Um, we use tools like, uh, like Valgrind to profiling and uh, looking for memory leaks. Um, you know, buffer overflows are still one of the most common exploits. It's still in the, been in the SANS top 10 since I was a young coder. Um, and then fuzz testing. Uh, fuzz testing, a new term? People know fuzz testing? Um, we typically don't do it with every interface on the system because um, to be effective, it, it typically needs to be targeted. Um, so we'll pick particular interfaces. Anything that accepts user input will typically fuzz test. And it's just throwing tons of garbage. Throw binary stuff at a text field, um, you know, randomly generate garbage and just try to flood the system. Uh, finds a class of problems that we don't find uh, any other way. Um, and then penetration testing. This is the fun stuff, the pen test. Um, uh, really gives us a real world read on have we been effective in uh, producing secure code. Um, this unfortunately is not something that's easy to just teach in a class. Uh, it's something that's a, a mindset. Uh, you really have to think differently to be effective as a pen tester. Um, so we get people who've uh, come out of the, uh, the world where they were doing things that um, uh, uh, they don't always talk about. And <laughs> we break those guys in, give them a white hat, 
and uh, they're amazingly effective. Um, but it just, if you take a normal developer, this is a really hard skill to pick up. Um, so it comes from a different place. Um, and then I think the last two I'll talk about in there, uh, threat and vulnerability analysis uh, and attack surface reviews. Um, so this is something that varies different from program to program and the, the level of effort you need to put in guarding against particular types of exploits varies by the type of uh, interfaces you have in your system. So that's what the threat and vulnerability analysis looks at. You know, do I have open text fields that I'm receiving input from the user? that they can run an automated bot against? Or am I, again, in that uh, in-tier level of security inside the, uh, the tightly controlled wall where there is no direct user access at all? Uh, so it makes a, a real difference about the level of uh, emphasis you need to put on building that defense in depth into your application. Um, let's see, oh, and then supply chain. I mentioned supply chain earlier. Uh, the places this comes from, the, the sources, uh, we talked about tools. Um, you know, Xcode Ghost was a prime example of getting a tool that introduced vulnerabilities into your code. Um, just about every application you buy today has third-party software in it. Uh, it's got library modules to do stuff. Um, uh, you know, many of our, the tools we use to help us build applications today uh, are third-party. And those, in turn, have other third-party uh, I think Palomita has traced down like uh, 18 levels of nesting in, uh, in a given product that, uh, that we were testing. And then again, the two types of risks. One is the inadvertent, oops, I made a mistake, uh, as well as particularly as we saw on the bottom of that DS, uh, Defense Science Board categorization where you've got the nation states who are you know, explicitly looking to introduce a vulnerability to achieve a particular result. All right, so that is uh, the environment under which we work, the kinds of standards that, uh, uh, that we're uh, uh, working to do. And then within that, we follow particular activities. So these are the things that you as software practitioners would do. Um, now, the first thing I wanted to show for context, this is our software playbook. Uh, so if you remember healthcare.gov, when it went live and did not work at all, and Silicon Valley came in to help the government. Um, and one of the best, most enduring things that came out of that was uh, a group called 18F uh, and the US Digital Services who defined a playbook. So it's much like the Agile Manifesto, right? These are high level principles about the right way to go about developing software. Um, so we decided to use that form. Uh, and these are our, these 14 plays are the principles behind our software development. And I wanted to point out uh, number three there is build in security, quality, and safety. All right. So it's, uh, you'll notice there's nine technical ones here and the last five are organizational kinds of things. Uh, so building in security is one of the top nine things we think we're all about when we develop software. So that's how much uh, mm -hmm. emphasis we put on it. And then these are the, the steps we do. And in the, the internal version of this, the, the proprietary version, takes all of our different frameworks, uh, our, uh, our Agile framework, our DevOps framework, the systems engineering lifecycle V, um, and even some places we still have to do waterfall because of the, uh, uh, the contracting vehicles we're under. And we map all of these uh, into all of those life cycles. So I'll, I'll walk through each of these walking through the life cycle, um, but these are the things that we actually do to produce your, your secure code. Uh, very first thing is to start at the beginning. Um, we set up the, the governance, the uh, command media for us is our set of policies and procedures, our internal Norfolk ones. Um, so we uh, decide according to the type of the project, which ones are, are relevant for that project. Uh, hopefully we don't have to train everybody. We get great graduates who know stuff and uh, uh, we work a lot on commonality among our problem, uh, programs so that we don't have to retrain every time we start up a new program. But uh, we've always got new people. There's always a need for some training, so we'll do that. Um, we try to use common tools. Um, uh, the, the tools we use to build our systems are in a lot of cases driven by our customers. So we don't always have the, the luxury of choosing uh, our preferred development environment, um, which would probably be you know, Linux and Java today. Um, but we have a lot of customers with heavy investments in uh, Microsoft Team Foundation server based systems, uh, you know, .NET kind of stuff, C Sharp, um, as well as some of those ancient ones I talked about. Um, so we'll uh, define common tools. Um, I mentioned a couple of those. Fortify is our uh, 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 security code scanning. Sonar Cube is our software quality. 
uh, code scanner and then uh, you know Eclipse for our IDE mm -hmm. TFS in the in the .NET environment. We set up quality gates. Um, you know if you if you don't uh, state what kind of uh, level of software assurance you want to achieve, you'll just get whatever you get. Right, so uh, defining those qualification base. If you're if you've done agile development, one of the big things in agile is definition of done for a user story. This is very much our definition of done for our applications. And then incident re response plan. You don't usually get those cat one, cat two errors until you're late in the life cycle in integration and test. And that's not the time to figure out how you're going to deal with a cat one error that's a security vulnerability so bad that you can't have that system live on the net. Um, so we wanted to find that up front. So that's all program startup stuff. Um, and then you, you may see some of the, the main players in software development today have special security life cycles. Uh, that's something we don't believe in at all. Uh, because that means if you've got a secure life cycle, that means you're doing a bunch of stuff in an insecure life cycle. And we don't want to do any of that. Um, so we don't want security to be a bolt-on. It's part and parcel of however we're developing a system, whether it's uh, waterfall or agile or a lot of our systems are in the middle we call them agile um, where we have somewhere on that continuum uh, but we uh, uh, we start at requirements for the system um, and build in our security requirements um, there's a lot of that that threat analysis and uh, the modeling and the uh, looking at the attack surface needs to go on at the very beginning when you're picking your architecture um, so that happens early on uh, environmental hardening is something that we've increasingly moved early in the life cycle. So typically we would have a development environment that wasn't hardened at all. You know, all the developers have root access. Uh, they need to be able to install stuff and configure stuff. Uh, so it was usually wide open. Um, anything, any security controls that you put in there are an obstacle to getting work done. Um, and then we'll have a develop, uh, integration and test environment, which is much closer to production, and then a production environment that's fully hardened and fully locked down. Well, we've learned that that kind of setup causes late breakage, right? You, you don't find all the things that don't work under a fully locked down environment until you're into that final production environment. So um, depending on the, the situation, we'll either get that integration and test environment locked down just like the production, or in some cases we can even do it in the development environment, particularly if we're uh, not doing greenfield development. This is an, an entirely new application, but where we're doing operations and maintenance on an existing environment will lock those development environments down to match production very much. And then I mentioned supply chain becoming increasingly uh, critical for us to know the pedigree of every single piece of software that we bring into our, uh, uh, into our environment. And we don't trust the suppliers to provide that for us, right? That's the, the tools like Palomita and Black Duck that we run to tell us what's in there. So that, you know, if there is an, another heartbeat kind of thing, we know if we've used OpenSSL and exactly what version of it. And, you know, had the vendor that we got our, our software from been good about patching all of the versions they were using in their development environment. And then in implementation, uh, I talked about the static code analysis. Again, we're going to do that on every check-in using plugins in our uh, interactive development environment as well as uh, doing those, the code scanning runs as part of every build. Um, peer reviews, uh, an entirely human process, uh, totally outside of the technology things that I've been talking about, uh, but still one of our best avenues for producing secure code. Uh, the other great thing about it, besides being very, very effective at finding both design flaws as well as inadvertent errors, uh, it also produces more learning than any of our other methods. So uh, developers, once they go through peer reviews, uh, don't tend to make those same kind of uh, uh, errors that introduce vulnerabilities later on. So very, very uh, strong part of our uh, approach to tackling this problem. Continuing monitoring, I mentioned DevOps. Um, so this is, you know, you're used to looking at, at uh, CPU cycles, network usage of systems that are in operation. Um, we're, tr again, trying to push that upstream. Um, that information is often not available to developers about how systems actually perform in production. And there's design things and implementation things we would do differently if we had that information. So uh, as soon as you get that first release out there, we want that communication flow uh, going from the operators back to the developers. Um, software integrity didn't used to be a concern at all. So this is when I ship out software, how do I know that the customer got the software I shipped and not something that was modified in transit? Um, so if you're doing automated update over the web, this is a huge issue. Um, if you're doing you know, manual installs where you bring uh, gold media to install from, it's less of an issue. So again, that's program dependent. 
but something we've got to figure out in the, uh, in the implementation phase. Once we get an integration and test, so now we have a full-up system, we can do that dynamic uh, scanning I talked about. We talked about fuzz testing, uh, resiliency testing. Anybody heard of Code Monkey? Code Monkey, Chaos Monkey. Um, so this is something Netflix does live in their environment. They have a process called Chaos Monkey that just goes through killing things. It kills processes off servers. It'll shut down routers. It'll even stop entire servers in their live production environment. Um, because when you do that, um, you find those things, you fix them, you build in the resiliency to work around them. Um, whereas if you don't do that, when one of those hits you live in production, you're just down and out for days. Um, so we'd rather do it early, uh, find those flaws, find ways to recover from them, uh, than just deal with them after the fact. And then finally, um, you get into verification, validation, and transition from the development organization to the, uh, uh, the operations organization. That's when we'll do the pen testing. Uh, security accreditation is something we have to do for almost all of, definitely all the defense systems we do, and even most of the federal systems have to receive an uh, approval to authorize. Uh, approval to operate uh, before they can go live on our customer networks, the uh, U.S. government networks. And then another thing that's new, we have typically stored versions of our software in CM and tagged them with the version uh, and just kept source code. And we're finding increasingly to be able to replicate some of the problems we see, we've got to save all those binaries. Um, so there at the end, this, this release archive of saving each of the binaries for each of our releases is something we've increasingly gone to to, uh, to help improve the code. And then once we're in operation, um, those uh, STIGs and IAVAs are information assurity, information assurance, vulnerability, awareness, I think is the A. Um, but those are the notes that come out that say, hey, uh, we found a new vulnerability that relates to this STIG. Here's the, the appropriate things you need to do to, uh, to make sure that you're not, uh, not vulnerable to it. Because one of, one of the scary things we see, we, uh, we can track how long it takes to, you know, Microsoft comes out with Patch Thursday. We, we know every one of the 120,000 PCs in our environment, how long it takes before each of those are patched. Um, and in a, a good environment like ours, that will happen within a 12-hour time frame. Uh, one of our federal customers who's distributed all over the world, their time frame is like months. Um, well, as soon as you release patches, there are bad guys out there who take the patch and reverse engineer them, right, to find the exploit that it's patching. And they can get out um, their sample code to exploit those vulnerabilities, typically available on the back black web within uh, half an hour after those uh, patches are posted. So you can see, you know, I'm doing really, really well if I'm patching in a couple hours and the vulnerabilities are in less than a half an hour. Um, so patching is just a huge part of, uh, uh, of secure code as well. All right, uh, so I'm getting close to being done. Let's talk about a couple of fun examples. Um, so this is out of FRAC uh, magazine back in 1996. Uh, talking about how to do buffer overflows. They call it smashing the stack back then. Uh, buffer overflows kind of become a more, uh, a more common term. Uh, so here's a little bit of C and C++ um, to look at a, uh, how do we get buffer overflows even in, in very, very simple code. Um, so this is a, a simple little program. We're, uh, we've got a couple of arguments. We're gonna uh, take one thing and uh, one argument and load it into this hello uh, and then we're gonna put that hello into another field called copy. So we got two variables, hello and, and copy, and the user input comes from hello and goes into copy. And then we combine that in a string. All right, so what's the buffer overflow? Anybody see the, the point of uh, a problem there? So to have a buffer overflow, you gotta have a buffer of some size, right? So in our case, it's... Uh, it's, well, it's the, the buffer is the variable copy, and you're right. The string copy is the problem here. Those of you who don't know C, um, string copy starts copying until it gets to a null character, and it'll just go. So it, it doesn't know that copy's only 10 characters long. If you're, uh, the, the fuzz testing that you put in, you know, has 348 characters before it has a null, um, string copy's just gonna go blindly writing all that through memory. Um, and so this is an exploit that's been around you know, since the 90s. Uh, it's very, very easy, particularly in C and C++, to overrun a buffer. Um, and once you do that, you start 
changing what's in memory, right? So you can actually put an arbitrary executable code, change the stack pointer so it points to that space in memory that you just wrote new code into, and now you're running an entirely different program uh, that, uh, that you put in. Uh, so there is a, there's a string in copy um, is the simple approach to, uh, to fixing that problem so that you tell it, you know, the number of characters uh, to copy. There's, there's other things that uh, uh, um, systems do to, to help prevent this problem, like keeping data and executable code separate uh, helps defeat a lot of these vulnerabilities. But it's still in the SANS top 10 of the vulnerabilities that are live and, uh, and wreaking havoc today. So the other, uh, other one I'll look at is SQL injection. Again, uh, a common top 10 hit. Um, uh, any XKCD fans here? Uh, I think this comic was the one that introduced me to XKCD. Uh, and un unfortunately, my lawyer said I couldn't include the comic uh, in this deck. So I've, I've given you the reference there. It's called Exploits of a Mom. Um, it's a mom that's gone to register her son at, uh, at school, and she's filling out a web form, and she has his name. And this is what she puts in for his name. Robert apostrophe parents semicolon drop table students semicolon dash dash space. Um, so what happens? You know, this... Um, uh, a single quote was supposed to terminate that string when it was used in a SQL query within the program, right? So by putting the quote in the input text, right, that ends uh, that string. And then, well, look, we've got some arbitrary input here that we're going to pass to the, the SQL command processor to, to execute. Um, and so um, she said, you know, did you really name your son Robert Tick blah, 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 blah? She says, oh, yes, we call him Little Bobby Tables. And, and this has become such a well-known meme. You'll find uh, there are sites out there devoted to fixing SQL injection called bobbytables.com kind of thing. So uh, uh, Little Bobby Tables is one of my favorite uh, SQL injection. Um, there was a case, and the biggest case of ID theft in American history was about that same time. The ex exploit was active 2007, 2009. Um, guy was convicted in like 2011, one of the most high profile com uh, convictions of American uh, hacker working with a couple of unnamed Russian associates who were never brought to justice. But this at the time was the largest ID theft, and it was a, a, a SQL injection flaw. So they hit 7-Eleven, uh, a credit card processor named Heartland, uh, and a supermarket um, with their point of sale system and had them dump out all of the credit card numbers in their database by using a SQL injection uh, attack. So that was all because, you know, uh, database systems are receiving input from the user that they're not sanitizing and escaping all of the, uh, all of the control characters. How about HB Gary and Aaron Bird? We have any anonymous fans in here? Nobody that's going to admit to it, huh? Um, uh, so uh, uh, Aaron Burr was the CEO of H.B. Gary Federal, uh, which is a, a security contractor for the government, and he was shaking Anonymous's chain. Uh, he was threatening to publish, uh, you know, their Facebook profiles, where they live, families, uh, kind of stuff. And Anonymous, as you might expect, did not take well to that. And if you've, you've seen the exploits by Lulsec, um, that started out of this episode. That was a group that broke off from Anonymous. Um, and they completely took down HB Gear. I mean, he resigned, they shuttered the company, um, and they got all of that data. Here's a guy who's running a security concern, and they were vulnerable to a SQL injection attack. Uh, and so that's how they pulled all the internal data, got root access to all the servers, just totally trashed the company. So don't tweak Anonymous. Uh, and then the Sony Pictures hack uh, that I'm sure you've all, uh, all heard of, the original entry point there was a SQL injection attack as well. That's how they got uh, access to the, uh, uh, the credentials that they used to go in and, uh, and do stuff. All right, uh, so here's my, uh, my SQL code. Uh, this will be our, our final fun project. Um, so find me the, the problems in this particular code set. So what I'm doing here is I'm, uh, I'm receiving a username and a password uh, from the user. Um, I'm going to hash that password, which is a good idea. I never store passwords in clean text. Um, and then I'm going to go um, concatenate these uh, into a, a query field that I'm going to pass to my query processor. So anybody want to guess at the source of some problems there? So I've taken raw input from the user, and I'm passing it directly uh, to my processor. You never, ever do that. You've got to sanitize all your inputs. You've got to escape them. Um, and then the, the bonus issue here that's not a, a SQL uh, injection thing, but a common, common problem we see 
is developers will want to write something themselves instead of using library routines. So they're, um, I mean, first of all, just hashing passwords is totally insufficient. Um, you've got to got to salt them. You've got to do some changes so that the uh, uh, you know rainbow tables aren't an effective uh, method to crack them. Uh, so you you don't implement your own hash function. You use the library function that's built in to do uh, secure coding kinds of things. And I think that uh, uh, concludes my talk. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions about secure coding uh, or even about life as a developer at Northrop Grumman, if you have any. Questions? Go forth and be secure. All right. Let's thank uh, Doug.